It's a real honor to have with us today Peter Goralnik. Uh, I've been a, a fan of Peter and his writing for, um, well, I guess decades now. Uh, I will confess that, that I, I saw Peter when I was a student here speak at um, the Brookline Booksmith uh, yeah, back, when, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> back when Last Train to Memphis came out. Um, but um, yeah, we're here to, uh, to uh, uh, have a conversation, not just about Elvis and his role in the American music pantheon, but hopefully about um, rock and roll history in general. I mean, for me, Peter is the seminal writer um, of, uh, of, uh, of American uh, music of the 20th century. So Peter, thank you very much. No, it's good to be, always good to be at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess before we go into your writings about everybody else, maybe you can tell us a bit about yourself, sort of what's your background and how did you end up finding yourself writing uh, music about all these all these legendary uh, figures in American well, not, uh, not all legendary. Music. I mean, also <laughs> figures that nobody's ever heard of who are just as important. But uh, it, uh, no, I just, I always wanted to be a writer. I had two ambitions as a kid, to be a writer and to be a baseball player. And I <laughs> carried each ambition as far as my talent would take me. Uh, but I did keep playing baseball until I was about 50, so I, I enjoyed that too. But I wanted to be a writer, and then when I was, 15, 16, I just fell into the blues, and it was something that was, there's no reason for it. It just kind of totally turned me around. Uh, it, it was, it just consumed me. And a few years later, maybe when I was 19 or 20, uh, the, um, well, maybe, maybe a little older, 21, 22, I had published a couple, a couple of collections of short stories when I was, uh, in, when I was 20, then when I was 21 or two. And then all of a sudden there was this opportunity, this underground press grew up, the Boston Phoenix here, the Village Voice had been going for a while. Uh, this was pre-Rolling Stone, but the first uh, rock and roll magazine was Crawdaddy, and this kid I knew uh, who was younger than I was, Paul Williams, started it on the campus of Swarthmore or Haverford, I'm not sure which. Uh, and um, anyway, so a few people said, how would you like to write about music? And I said, yeah, I'd like to write about blues. And you know, so for, I was in early, issues of Crawdaddy, which were about Moby Grape and Jefferson Airplane and, you know, Janis Joplin, Big Brother and the Holding Company, that kind of thing. And there I am writing about Robert Pete Williams, or Buddy Guy, who was virtually unknown at the time. This is back like in 67, 66, 67. But the, my entire reason for writing about music, <clears throat> it had nothing whatsoever to do with any professional ambitions. I was writing novels, I was writing stories, and I still am. But it was just with the idea of telling people about this music that I thought was so great, about telling people about the James Brown show. I mean, I was writing previews for the Phoenix for quite a while, and I would write a description of Howlin' Wolf or the James Brown show. The James Brown show, which to me, I wrote at the time, I would still say was the greatest theater I've ever seen. And I went to a lot of theater, but I've never seen anything more spontaneous or eruptive or just devastating than the James Brown show at, 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 at that time. And so that's, that was my whole purpose in writing. And eventually I just had to, I wanted to find a language that I was comfortable with in, or I, or I shouldn't say eventually I wanted to, I just did find a language which is not being a musicologist, not being a musician, not being an ethnomusicologist. I wanted to find a language in which I could convey my love of the music, my admiration for people like Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Merle Haggard, you know. He, and th and I hit on sort of writing profiles. I mean, I, it, it took me. It didn't take that long, but that's what I, I that's what I gravitated. Skip James and I gravitated towards that, and it enabled me to write with not just with enthusiasm, but with with a respect for what, what I wanted to be, a respect, a, for, an idiomatic respect for the music and the people who made the music, and finding a language that conveyed the idiom without demeaning the subject. And uh, that basically, uh, you know, called attention to something that I thought was as great as, you know, anything that I had ever encountered. I mean, Robert Johnson and John Donne. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, it's uh, Thomas Pynchon and Howlin' Wolf. I mean, they're all in the same ballpark. And that was, I mean, it wasn't that I wanted to tell people, well, you should read V or Gravity's Rainbow, and then you should listen to Howlin' Wolf's album. I mean, it wasn't that it had to be directly connected, but but it was connected in the sense that these that this was art of 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 as great an order. It could be Minkus, could be Monk. I mean, I wasn't writing about them, but it was the same kind of thing. Hmm. Um, 
How did you choose? Actually, I have a question about writing. <coughs> so it's interesting you mentioned all these independent publications that are now long gone. Probably a lot of people in the audience haven't heard of Crawdaddy or, uh, or the Boston Phoenix even. And, and heck, maybe some of them not even about Rolling Stone <laughs> magazine. But do you think that the, the, the death of this independent press is actually um, in any way not enabling you know, new, new voices or even um, you know, sort of truly independent writing to, to come about. Um, I know it's a writer question, but you, you mentioned that, so it just... Not, not really, think. no. I mean, I, I think the, the, the big difference, I mean, there's all kinds of outlets and there's all kinds of opportunity, uh, you know, online through the internet. Uh, the, the distinction, I think, is that you no longer, nothing is filtered anymore, and this is the reason, in a sense, uh, not just for pol political division, but essentially f it's what encourages the rise of what people now call populism, but which I just think is straight out fascism, uh, because everybody thinks that if they assert something, uh, you know, in an unfiltered way, asserting something makes it true. But it, 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 so I think that there, there's certainly, there is something really lost, there's something lost in the sense of, of that long form journalism has uh, pretty much disappeared. I mean, Sports Illustrated, for example, was a haven for a long time of long-term, uh, long-form uh, uh, journalism, and, and it's just people can't afford it anymore. Rolling Stone, uh, you know, for many years, and I'm not, it, it, nothing is a panacea, and I'm not saying there was a golden age. I, there's never been a golden age. I mean, the golden age, it's like that Woody Allen movie about Paris. The golden age is always the age <laughs> back there, you know. When you're in what you think is the golden age, the people there think it was back there. But uh, it, it, it's, you know, I think that idea of exploring, exploring things in a considered way, I mean, Rolling Stone had a uh, review section, which, again, I, I'm not trying to elevate that to the sky or saying that, but, but the point is people could write at considerable length and in considerable ambiguity, complexity, <laughs> division, and divisiveness, you know, about what they were passionate about. And now it's just, it's all three stars, A plus, you know, A minus, B plus, thumbs up, whatever. Or, so or vitriolic comments from social media that get yeah, yeah. everybody down. So I think that, that that's, but I think there's just as much opportunity. I think what, you know, what, one thing I didn't mention in terms of writing is that, uh, because I think everything is self-generated in, in terms of writing or in terms of music. I mean, it, it's, or in terms of entrepreneurial. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, the point is that it's, you have to be committed to yourself. That's really the, that's the fundamental thing. And uh, when I was 15, around the same time as I fell into the blues, uh, I uh, read uh, this interview with Ernest Hemingway in the Paris Review, which is online now and you can read it. And it's, uh, but basically what I took from it, um, uh, and then when I was teaching at Vanderbilt, I taught creative writing for the last 12 years down at Vanderbilt, and I often assigned it because he talks about the mechanics, not the mechanics of writing, but the commitment to writing. And the thing, what he talked about was the fact that he wrote every single day, and that he tried to write so many words a day, and that he totaled up his words. He would say, oh, today was a bad day, or not a bad day, but I think he wrote 350, then maybe it was 751 the next day, but that you were committed to that, and then he could go fishing in the afternoon or go drinking at night. But the writing was the first thing. And I thought, I mean, like I was 15, and like I said, baseball consumed me too. But I, I, uh, I just thought, well, shit, I mean, I, I may not, be able to write on that level, uh, but mm -hmm. I can write in that way. I can commit myself to writing. And I started when I was 15, and uh, writing every day, and I pretty much have continued till now. But I mean, like, when I went, when I went to college, I went to Columbia, I hated Columbia. <laughs> but, you know, and I'd have early classes because you, you, everything was about the great, um, it was like a great books thing, I forget what they called it. But so you had to take early classes. And so if I had a class, I don't know when, nine o'clock, say. Yeah, I would get up at five. I would go have breakfast at Tom's, which is the restaurant that they had in Seinfeld. And then I would go back to my room, my lonely room, and I would write. And then I would go after class. And then when I started working, I worked at the booksmith for a long time. I, mean, I dropped out of school, was working at various booksmiths. And again, it was, you know, it didn't matter what else I was doing. It didn't matter if I got in three o'clock in the morning. I, mean, I wasn't giving up my life, but I was determined to do the writing. And so, so that's, that, that to me, that's why it doesn't matter what, what the outlets are. And I mean, the last, uh, Panis was asking me what I've been working on, and I've been writing the last, recently. 
And since uh, the summer, I've written these three long short stories for which I have no, I mean, I don't have anything in mind. I just wanted to write them. They're, they're each about 15,000 words. In the last three months, I've been working on a profile of Dick Curlis, who was a great, great singer from uh, Maine, a country singer, um, and wh whom I met when my son was producing this album, Traveling Through for Rounder, which is one of the most soulful albums of all time. I mean, I, I was telling Panos a story about giving, sending the, the album to uh, Sam Phillips. And the next time I saw him, he said, you know that album you did on Charlie Rich, Pictures and Paintings, which was the last album Charlie did, which was, Charlie did, which was all these songs he had carried around with him for 10, 15, 20 years, blues and jazz-oriented songs, Duke Ellington songs, that he had wanted to record. And we did it. And, and so Sam said, you know how much I love the Charlie Rich album? And I said, yeah. He says, I listened to it all the way, driving to Nashville, all the way coming back. I said, yeah, I know that. He said, well, you know this... This uh, Dick Curlis album that your son produced, he said, you know, it's much better. And it is. It's, it's really a soulful. I mean, those, both albums are just albums of personal expression. It has no, nothing to do with my connection to them. It's just purely. And they were albums that gave, that gave so much satisfaction. I mean, Charlie Rich, whom I'd known for 20, 20, 25 years at that point, he called me after we'd done the album. And he says, you'll never guess what I've been doing this afternoon. And I, we, had the, we hadn't mixed the album yet, but I said, no, I don't, I, what, what have we been doing? He's been driving around in my 190 SL. I said, oh, that's cool, you know, nice. He says, and you know what I've been doing? He says, uh, I said, what are you doing? He said, and he never called on the phone. Charlie was um, agoraphobic, and he was telephone averse, and he, was, he just never called, you know, but he did call this time. And he says, you know, so I, and he says, and I've been, uh, I've been listening to music, he's, or whatever it was. And he says, I, he says, you know what I've been listening to? I said, what? He said, I've been listening to our album. And he said, I listened to it over and over again, and I just love it, man. And that's all that mattered. I mean, it didn't matter what happened after that. Uh, but it was, uh, and nothing much happened, because Charlie, who, as I say, was agoraphobic, uh, we set up three, um, what do you call it when you do these, uh, showcase, uh, Bookings, you know, where he would play at the uh, what's the jazz club down on uh, on uh, off Star Drive in the hotel. Uh, Scholars. Scholars, yeah. We had a thing at Scholars. We had a thing out in Hollywood at the Roosevelt Hotel. I forget what the room was. We had a thing in New York, uh, another jazz place, and he blew them all off. But but um, but the thing was that was what mattered. And the same thing with the Dick Curlis album. I mean, Jake did an incredible job. My son Jake. But it wasn't Jake, it was Dick Curlis, and it was his commitment and the, the fact that the music meant everything to him. So and that's what it ought, to, it ought to mean to you. Um, and, and of course, to, you talking about your commitment to writing just reminds me a lot of what the students here go through. You know, there's this obsession with perfecting their, their craft. But I want to, so I want to go back to uh, you tackling Elvis. Um, you know, obviously by the time you wrote your book. Who it, loved football. Who loved football. Yes. <laughs> in, in, uh, not my kind of football. I see mine is soccer, but that's a different story. He might have uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, The man never toured Europe, man, so I'm not sure if he was into soccer. But <laughs> um, by the time you wrote your first book, Last Train to Memphis, you know, this is the mid 90s, mm -hmm. a lot was already written about this guy, and certainly most people probably thought, gee, you know, like, What's new, you know? So I'm just wondering, what, what made you tackle a subject about which so much was written? And then how did you approach it in, in, in such a unique perspective? And then ultimately, um, you know, for me, those are the two. The two books you wrote about him are the, the two definitive books on Elvis. Well, you know, the, the thing was that I, I wanted, I wasn't sold on, I, I, on the idea. I, I didn't feel that anybody had really written a, a, I'll tell you who wrote a good book about Elvis was Jerry Hopkins. I mean, it's a very good repertorial, journalistic, uh, and, and it, it deserves to be read. It's, it, it, I think it continues to be read. But for the most part, all the things were just kind of, they weren't tell-alls. They were tell-sums, and they were, you know, or they, they, or they, they just weren't, it, 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 it didn't make any difference that they had, from my point of view. But I... I had written the uh, chapter on Elvis in the Rolling Stone Illustrated History of Rock and Roll, and, uh, which is also a chapter in, in my second book, Lost Highway. And you can see from that, that I'd written that in 76, I think, I mean, just before he died. And um, you can see from that, I mean, I never thought I'd write about Elvis again, because that was as much as I could say from the, out, from the outside. You know, it, it, 
I tried to be as accurate, I tried to be as honest, I tried to be as forthright as I could, and, and I was. It was as, as much as I could from the outside, and I, the epigram from it was the William Carlos Williams uh, thing, the pure products of America go crazy, and which I wouldn't attach to the biography, but that was, but I, but, and it, you know, but the thing was, I thought that's as much as I can say without, from the outside, uh, you know, in a sort of an external sense. And then somebody, I think, somebody had suggested to me writing a biography of Elvis, and I thought, no, that doesn't make any sense. And then I was working on this documentary, which I eventually, which I took my name off of, uh, but, but. Uh, what was it called? It was called Elvis 56. Okay, and it's, yeah. it's a It's a beautiful it, yeah. uh, um, image. The images are all Alfred Wertheimer's, and they're really beautiful, and, and uh, it's worth seeing. It was just, there were serious artistic uh, disagreements about the, uh, uh, the narration. That never caused a breakup in anyone's <laughs> artistic difference. But it was good. I'd, I'd written a contract where it was just, it was a contract in thirds, and I left two-thirds of the way through, and I left happily, and, you know, I, and it's well worth seeing. I mean, it's nothing to do with, with me. But the thing is, in the course of doing that, uh, at that time, again, this is way pre-internet, pre this, uh, I, I would guess this was around 86 or so, and uh, the, the, the um, couple who were, uh, made the uh, film collected all of the, uh, uh, all of the interviews that they could find with Elvis, which were very few and were from 55 and 56. Uh, uh, and they just weren't accessible or available at all. And I might have heard some, but I mean, I started listening. And I got this idea that, you know, it was like Elvis could speak for himself. He didn't need this, the intermediary. He didn't need my interpretation. He didn't, I mean, which is obviously untrue. I mean, if you write a book, if each of you wrote a book, about Elvis with access to all of the information, all of the research, all of the interviews that I did, you would all write different books, different from each other and different from me, because it, it is the, the author shapes, just as a, a photographer, by, you know, by the way you frame the photograph, by what you cut out of it, what, would you, what you include in it. But I just, it, so that was sort of a revelation. And around the same time, I was writing this book, Sweet Soul Music, uh, about Southern soul music, uh, focused on Memphis and Macon and Muscle Shoals, and uh, or on the people, and not not on the cities, uh, but uh, and I was driving down uh, Macklemore. Uh, I was uh, with um, this friend of mine, Rose Clayton, and just about almost at the point, uh, stacks either had been torn down or was about to be torn down before it got rebuilt for the museum, uh, and there was a, a boarded up. Um, uh, drugstore, kind of opposite. It may not have been exactly opposite, but where Stax was. And this, uh, Rose Clayton said, oh, you know, um, I used to see Elvis in there. And I said, really? You know, she said, you know, like his cousin Gene used to work there and Elvis would come in and um, wait for Gene to get off work. And she said he would just sit there at the, at the, um, the counter and he would just, you know, he'd just, he'd, he would just be drumming his fingers and then she says, poor baby. And I just, it was like a revelation for me. It was just a funny kind of a thing. It was just, that was the Elvis I wanted to describe. So the book I wanted to write, like all the profiles that I wrote, I'm not claiming to have achieved it, but this is what I wanted to do, were, were intended to be from the inside out. They were intended to reflect the world that the person I'm writing about saw and the aspirations that that person had and you know, the, not with a, a, the aim of judgment and not with a knowledge of what was going to happen before it happened, but to stay in the moment, to stay in the present. And so that was what I, that's what I tried to do. And, and Last Train was, I mean, in a way, it, it, Careless Love took a lot more, Careless Love, it, it was a much more difficult book to write from many points of view because the internal story was not reflected by external events. I mean, it made no difference what, what movie Elvis was making. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he was making, uh, you know, Blue Hawaii or he was making um, Fun in Acapulco, well, I think Blue Hawaii he may have been more committed to, but the point was, this didn't tell the story of who Elvis was. Last Train, everything that happened for him, it was just like the ultimate Horatio Alger story. It was, I mean, and it was, it's a story that you've seen in your time. I mean, you've seen with, you know, uh, you know, whether you 
I mean, think of a singer uh, or a musician that you admire who's achieved enormous success. Anyway, I mean, Ma Michael Jackson, Prince. I mean, that yeah, uh, that but I'm thinking of even somebody somebody more contemporary. And but it, but but with Elvis, it's just he achieved far beyond the wildest expectations that anyone could ever that he could have ever had, except for these visions that he and his mother had, because they were both of them were whether visionary is the right word, but they were spiritual in the sense, and they. They saw things in the sky, and, and each of them saw Elvis's success. I don't think there's any question that they did in a, in a, I mean, given that Elvis's later life was consumed with his spiritual studies, with reading Gurdjieff, with reading Madame Blavatsky, with reading um, Autobiography of a Yogi, and, and things that are much more obscure than that, and with studying them. And, uh, but, but, so they may have had some inkling, but what he, everything just fell into place in, in, in a way that nobody, that nobody could have envisioned that he could never have imagined and he encountered successes in areas that he knew nothing about and yet that he embraced. And so, in a, in a funny way, Last Train was a book that, it didn't write itself at all, but, but <laughs> telling the external story, following the chronological sequence, following what happened, mm -hmm. told the story of who he was and what he was trying to do. Why, why Elvis? You know, like, there has been in, 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 the, uh, in this continuum of music that you and I spoke about, there have been thousands, right, of, 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 of musicians and, and performers and entertainers. But for some reason, this one singular figure for most of us stands out. Um, and, and it's interesting because as we were talking, I, I didn't grow up here. But Elvis changed my life. As a five-year-old, I, right. I saw him on TV in King Creole, and I said, I want to move to America one day and study guitar and, and be a musician. What is it about, about this guy that, I mean, beyond the imagery, there, there must be something more. Well, I, I think that it's not a unique thing, but it's a highly unusual thing. It's the difference between, <clears throat> and I, be, I may be naming, throwing out names that, you're, that you don't know and that you can't identify with. I mean, it, but it's the difference between someone like Sam Cooke, who I would say is, is an Elvis-like figure, and Johnny Taylor, who sounded exactly like him, but didn't have that warmth, or didn't have, you know, didn't, or uh, Jackie Wilson, who was a phenomenal performer, but again, couldn't draw people to him. And somebody like, like Elvis, it really came down to his voice. And it wasn't in any way that he had the greatest voice of all time. The people he admired, people like Jake Hess, who was the lead singer for the Statesman, who were a white gospel quartet of flamboyant, well, a great, great quartet. And Jake Hess was a far more virtuosic singer. I mean, Elvis admired the hell out of him and actually did everything, he recorded with him on, um, uh, I think on How Great Thou Art, brought him into the studio, but, uh, but, but just sought his advice, sought his, and Jake, and, or somebody like Roy Hamilton, the great rhythm and blues singer, but who was really more of almost a semi-operatic singer who sang You'll Never Walk Alone and sang, um, all I can think of now is Don't Let Go. I'm trying to think what his biggest hit was. But, uh, but these were people that Elvis admired who had much bigger voices and, and greater range and more virtuosic qualities. But it's like Jake has said about Elvis, the thing about him is he communicates every word, which is what Ray Charles said to me about Sam Cooke. It's not the perfection of the voice. I mean, Sam Cooke did have a, just an almost perfect voice, but Ray Charles, is, you know, said, uh, he said it wasn't that he hit all the notes, it was that all the notes were in the right place and that they said something. And with Elvis, Jake Hess said it's, it's, he sings every word as if he means it. And I, I remember talking to this guy, uh, this promoter in uh, Gladewater, Texas, named Tom Perryman. He was in radio and he promoted some of Elvis's earliest concerts outside of Memphis, or they weren't concerts, they were shows. And he said, you know, he, says, I, they were, he was performing at a humble oil camp in East Texas, uh, somewhere near Gladewater. And uh, Tom Perryman said, I looked out at the audience and I saw these three women, mother, grandmother, and daughter, or daughter, granddaughter, three generations of women. He says, and every one of them was just totally fixated on Elvis and it was as if he was singing, this is a 19-year-old kid, 20-year-old kid, it was as if he was singing directly to them. And this was the experience that people had before they, I mean, this is the experience that people got from the, from the 
music, from the radio, from the... And, and, and this is before, you know... No, no television, no. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and live entertainment at that point, I mean, it sounded like crap. I mean, yeah. this is not no, no, a modern and, recording system or sound and, system. And Elvis's voice. I mean, Elvis, you know, was self-taught in so many ways. And he studied voice when he was in the Army, and he came out, and the records he makes after the Army are considerably more, you know, his voice is better controlled, he's placing, uh, he's using his diaphragm more. He's, it's a very conscious approach, and I don't think it, 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 and some of his greatest recordings are made in the immediate aftermath of his coming out of the Army. But, but so his voice, it's not that he's studied voice, it's not that he knows what he's doing, but it's the pure feeling of it. And it came across through the radio, it came across in, the, in performance, it didn't come across, this was nothing iconic about this at all. It was just purely that, that he drew people as Sam Cooke did and as, you know, I, I sometimes I think of other people too. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of anybody quite, you know, at, at the moment. But, but those would be two examples of people and you can see the difference between them and somebody who sounds just like them or you can hear the difference. It, there, is, there is a communication going on that can't be defined and can't be recapitulated and it's not it's not like everybody should aspire to be like that because it's it's not like Caruso. It's not like he's hitting the highest, you know, he's hitting the high C beyond high C or something. So for me, there's the record business pre-Elvis and after Elvis. And this guy had nobody to really model himself after. I mean, fine, you know, there was Sinatra, clearly, who was a, a very big singer in, in, in his time. But... Um, did Elvis have the, have this insatiable drive to become Elvis, or did things just fall into place for him because of outside forces that were happening in society at the time as as well? The rise of the teenager, the uh, the radio, TV, all these things sort of coming together. Well, everything was changing at the time. I mean, the point is that that the rock and roll was something that Sam Phillips, whom I wrote about, was he had envisioned you know, five years before it arrived, or probably much longer than that, but the point is he was articulating it. Uh, the idea that music could cross all racial barriers, that this black music that Sam Phillips was recording initially, that Ike Turner, the Howlin' Wolf, that they could achieve the universal acceptance that Elvis eventually did. That, and, you know, there he is in the Memphis Commercial Appeal, the Memphis Press Seminar in 1951, saying this music is not limited to a particular audience. This music is not limited to what was then called the race market or the R&B market. This is for everybody. And that's eventually what it is. So Elvis sort of came in, and in Billboard and Cashbox, which were the trade publications, I mean, Billboard's still around, uh, you know, there were predictions. Or they were, there was a lot of wondering what's going to happen because they could see the markets crossing. They could see the country market, the R&B market, both of them crossing into pop, both of them crossing. And so Elvis inherited that. But what Elvis set out, Elvis was somebody who was so consumed with music. I mean, the drive, he, was, he had a drive to succeed. I mean, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't what drove him most of all. It was this, it was, he was so consumed with music in the same way that you may be or that you know, people you know or people you admire are. And he, uh, well, again, I was talking to somebody recently. I, I did an interview and I was saying that the thing that has struck me of all the musicians that I've, um, interviewed over the years, and it's quite a few, and crossing a lot of different, you know, uh, genres and stuff. It's not that they you couldn't find every range of political opinion. It's not that you could find that you would say, oh, they're f absolutely free of prejudice of any kind. But within the framework of music, I've never met anyone who had any prejudice or was confined to category or didn't appreciate music of every sort. So with Elvis or with Sam Cooke and with so many other people, with Merle Haggard, I mean, you had people who were just driven to embrace music of every kind. I mean, when Elvis and, and who were trying to incorporate all that they heard into the music that they created. And it, uh, you know, and I, again, I, I would be, I'd be very surprised. Again, I'm not trying to, to ascribe political correctness or, you know, orthodoxy to all the people. I mean, believe me, I've heard everything from everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that isn't the issue. What I'm saying is in terms of the music, I, every one of them has had their ears wide open. And I would say that was what drove, I mean, it was just ultimately what Elvis tried to do in Las Vegas 
which is not a period that I'm particularly admiring of, but he wanted to present every element of American music that he admired, from gospel music to R&B to, you know, yeah. ballads to, and, and that was the intent behind the act that he put together for Vegas. Um, so, you know, at lunch we were talking about this, you know, the art commerce thing. So Elvis... Yeah, but that was off the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elvis meets Colonel Tom Parker, and I think, arguably for me, their partnership is one of the most, if not the most important partnership in the history of rock and roll, mm -hmm. because it changes everything. It changes the way that... Um, we perceive musicians, it changes the role, I think, of, of a musician in, in, in society, it becomes a much bigger thing. I'd love for you to talk a bit about that relationship. And ultimately, you know, Colonel Tom Parker has been vilified, I think, over right. the course of history. Is, is, is that fair, given the immense role no. that he actually played? No, 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 if there's, one, if there's anyone who deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is, a, I mean, Halls of Fame in general are ridiculous, and mm -hmm. the Rock and Roll Hall of we, Fame we agree is no on that. less ridiculous than any other. But if there was one person who deserved to be in the putative Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that we, you know, that represented everything, every ideal, it would be, it would be Colonel Parker, along with Elvis, along with Sam Phillips, because he was as much a visionary in terms of business, in terms of branding, in terms of figuring out how to get, he didn't care what, I mean, he believed in Elvis, and he was determined to get Elvis across. Mm -hmm. And you can disagree with his aesthetic decisions, although ultimately he didn't make any. I mean, he, he, it was his marketing that totally revolutionized the business. There was nobody like him before. As much as there was nobody like Elvis, quite like Elvis, there was nobody like him, and maybe that was the confluence of events too. Was 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 the Colonel the one who sort of believed in Elvis as as an image? Uh, I mean, whose idea was that to sort of? You know? Well, he he. The thing was that that Colonel saw Elvis. Um, if you were his friend, you, he he was Colonel. Actually, he could be the colonel, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I always thought it was great to drop the article, you know, you just... Uh, but he, uh, uh, he, he saw Elvis... Um, it, it, one thing that just to make clear, and then I'll do the answer what you were asking, the, Elvis chose the colonel. I mean, as much as colonel chose him. Elvis wanted to be on a broader stage, a wider stage. Sam Phillips was as compelling, as messianic, as just persuasive a person uh, as I've ever met. He was an astonishing person, and he had El he totally convinced Elvis of. I mean, it wasn't that Elvis ever, but Elvis made the correct decision, as did Sam Phillips, that he could never go anywhere on Sun Records in Memphis. Sam didn't have the money. He didn't have, and. He wanted to be, he wanted to make movies. He wanted to be in Hollywood, he wanted, and he chose Colonel for those reasons. And when, r right after uh, Colonel had sold his contract to RCA in November of 55, uh, he wrote Colonel, sent Colonel, I guess, a telegram, maybe it was a note, saying, you are like a father to me, you know, and it, it was totally sincere. But Colonel's, what, Colonel had several, you know, just counter, intuitive visions at the time. One was that uh, he wanted to put Elvis on TV, because, which nobody did, because they, they had seen the death of vaudeville through uh, the TV variety shows. People who had gone out and done the same act week after week after week did their act on TV, and then everybody had seen it. Hmm. Colonel believed that Elvis, that this was the one way he had of introducing Elvis to the world that in you know, one television appearance, there was the opportunity to reach more people than he would in a year of, uh, eventually with Ed Sullivan or uh, Steve Allen, than a, of a year of personal appearances. So over the objections of the talent of William Morris, who had, who had written in the contract that they would support this, over the objections of RCA, who had written in the contract that they would support this, in the absence of any support from anybody else, Colonel got him on the, on the um, Jackie Gleason Presents, the Dorsey Brothers show. <coughs> Uh, got four appearances with, uh, you know, an option for two more. So Elvis made six appearances right in a row. And it worked the way Colonel said. He then got, got him on the Steve Allen when Ed Sullivan said, I wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole. Then he was on Ed Sullivan three times uh, in, and until January 57. That was the last appearance. Then he withheld him from TV, the Colonel did, until 1968, which again was a calculated vision of just as you never gave the record company more than uh, you, because you, you lost your bargaining power 
if you went in and you recorded a hundred songs, it's all very well to say, you know, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to walk. But they have a hundred of your songs, and they can, you know, make money off you for the next whatever five years. So uh, it was the idea that scarcity was of value, mm. and then the idea that the uh, that the movies could serve essentially as a preview of what MTV eventually was. That the movies were, you know, like. Um, uh, what do you call videos, it? Videos, music like, videos. Yeah, like music videos, and the music led people to the movies. And again, it was it was just that that uh, interlocking vision, which I I, I don't know. It, it's not totally against uh, it, nobody in terms of popular music had ever succeeded in doing it to that extent. Musicals in general did it, but not with the idea of focusing on a single. It's interesting because I never I never saw Elvis's movies as music videos, but now that you mention that, that just makes so much sense in terms of. What it heralded. I mean, and I've I've heard. I don't know if this is true that the '68 comeback special, which we showed here on Monday, that in some ways that was the inspiration for MTV Unplugged. Is is that correct? Oh, I don't know. You'd have to ask Bill Flanagan. He would. <laughs> he would. Uh, but it is. It yeah. No, I mean it. It certainly presages. I mean it. It's it. It certainly mirrors it. You know, and 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 it. Uh, uh, and and uh, you know so it. But in so many ways, I mean, there too, the reason for the 68 special was actually so that Colonel could make a deal which would amount to, I think, a million dollars. I mean, Elvis's movie stock had gone down at this point, and the, uh, the, uh, the 68 special was part of a movie deal, which, uh, hmm. and, you know, the, the story has been told over and over again that Colonel was supposed to be a Christmas special, that Colonel had opposed it, but none of that is really true. Uh, the what was eventually done was true to a vision that Elvis had that uh, Steve Binder and Bones Howe, who was a music director who kind of got dropped from the, out of the picture, but who was very instrumental in this. It was very much along the lines of something that evolved, and it was something that was never opposed by Colonel. What do you think is the most misunderstood part about um, Elvis's contribution to American music history? I suppose the most misunderstood would, would be the, uh, you know, the idea of, of um, you know, cultural appropriation or cultural theft. And uh, the, I think the reason that it's misunderstood is not, it's not unique to Elvis. It's simply that you would have to look at the music business in a more realistic way before you spoke of that. And with the idea that ultimately all the power lies in the publishing and that people like uh, Sam Cooke, Ray Charles, that essentially where the money is to be made is in the publishing, and that the publishing, mm -hmm. uh, and the songwriting too, I mean the two together, but the publishing most of all, is uh, color, race, and uh, genre blind. And the whole idea is to have as many people as possible in as many genres and as many ways as possible record your songs, and that's how you make your money. But from the time that I think radio and the phonograph were invented, uh, at the beginning of the, or, you know, became, let's say roughly at the beginning of the 20th century and then with their popularity in the, from the 20s on, you just didn't have any corner of America that was immune to every type of influence, musical influence, I mean. And from that point on, you ha whether you had, you had a great soul and blues singer like Bobby Blue Bland who grew up listening to the Grand Old Opry and to the end of his life, loved country music and loved it for the, story, the way in which it told stories, the stories it told and applied the lessons that it offered to his incredibly soulful versions of songs that had nothing to do with country and western. Or si similarly, he, uh, Bobby, to take Bobby Bland as, uh, you know, carry that further, one of the singers he most admired was Perry Como for the smooth way he approached it. I mean, it's a totally bland kind of approach. I mean, I, I, you know, I would think, or I mean, I don't know, maybe, you know, Perry Como was a good singer and everything, but who would ever think that Bobby Bland, the most soulful of singers, so he takes, on the one hand, he's got the Grand Old Opry, he's got Perry Como somewhere here, and then his other inspiration is Aretha Franklin's father, the Reverend C.L. Franklin, for the squall that he did in, in, in the middle of his songs, this kind of scrock that he would do, and came out of Reverend C.L. Franklin's uh, uh, you know, sermons, uh, sung sermons. So the thing is, so who's, who's appropriating who? And you, you can say, 
you could say a woman could never appropriate a man because women are mistreated, which is true. I mean, it's true that they're mistreated, and, and there, there is no parity. You could say that minorities can never appropriate because of their mistreatment. But the fact is that all of these things are amalgams. Howlin' Wolf, the greatest pure blues singer I've ever seen, the most, you know, uh, he, when the first time I met him, um, and I was just scared to death. <laughs> uh, that, you know, it was like, I mean, not just because of his, his, not because of his size or anything, just because of his greatness, because he was just, to be in the presence of someone like that. And he starts talking about, you know, that boy from Memphis, that boy who went out to Hollywood made such a success. And I just couldn't figure out who he was talking about. You know, is he talking mm -hmm. about, uh, a, you know, bronze buckaroo or something, some, <laughs> some black cowboy who, you know. <laughs> I, well, you know, eventually we got down to it. I said, finally, I said, you mean Elvis Presley? And he says, yeah. And I, uh, maybe I snickered or I laughed or something, thinking he's, mm -hmm. he's putting me on. He says, don't laugh about that. You know, he, that boy is a great blues singer, but he made his money. You know, and he was admiring of, you know, every aspect of Elvis. Wow. Uh, and when you talk to Wolf about where his style came from, uh, and, and there could be no more just pure African-American, you know, uncompromising style in the world. And you ask him, and he, and he would start talking about Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music, and said that it was from the Jimmy Rogers yodel that he got uh, his... Um, you know, his, his, uh, his howl from. And again, I, I mean, there have been, this has happened so many times to me, but I, I mean, I'm thinking like, you're putting me on, you know, it's like, I, you know, I may look naive and I may be naive and I'm not going to say anything, but he was absolutely serious and couldn't back it up chapter and verse. It, it's interesting to hear you say that because, you know, the art tends to mostly be blind to, you know, to racial and cultural issues. I mean, people have something to express and they're often influenced in all kinds of ways. Whereas I think it's us sometimes on the outside looking in that tend to pass judgment about, about that. Um, well, yeah, no, and you can. I mean, it's, the, you can totally understand where the, where the judgment comes from because from a political point of view, it's absolutely true. It's like if you said Sam Cooke was killed because he was a proud black man and he got too big for his britches, and you saw it as a conspiracy on the part of the white ruling class, from a symbolic point of view, I would agree with that 100%. I don't think it happened that way. I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that it did. From, from, from the standpoint, in terms of the truth about our society, it's absolutely true. And so it, it uh, but if you listen to the music, let's say with Elvis, if you listen to a song like Mystery Train, it comes from just a pure and unadulterated admiration and love for little Junior Parker and for his version of my Mystery Train. But it isn't a copy of it. It's a different version, and it's not intended in any way to replace Little Junior Parker. And it wouldn't be as if Elvis would come in here and say, "I'm so much better than Little Junior Parker." He would tell you about Little Junior Parker. He knew everything about Little Junior Parker. He knew everything about Sam Cooke. He knew, you know, he he just admired the hell out of them. But what he wanted to do, he wanted to do, it was an homage to Little Junior Parker, and he just wanted to take his place in the room. And when in Las Vegas at the press conference right after his uh, opening night performance in Vegas in 69, and somebody said, you're the king of rock and roll, which he always rejected, and he says, there's only one king, which is another, another issue. <laughs> but uh, he said, no, listen, if you want to see the real king of rock and roll, there's Fats Domino sitting back there. He's the real king of rock and roll. And he never shied away from that. But I mean, but I think that's, in a way, he didn't think anybody was the king of rock and roll. You know, it's something that struck me throughout the whole week in talking to a bunch of people that that, that's maybe the thing that resonated with me the most, that ultimately this is a guy for whom music just flowed through him. And yeah, it, no, he, he was a, music. agnostic to the genre. I mean, whether it was gospel, rock and roll, later he covered all kinds of music, you know, Beatles uh, uh, and, and so forth. And, and it just, again, it's something that I think we often miss about him. Um, this is actually a, a, a question from a student. You, um, you, you talk about this concept of a musical continuum. Can you, mm -hmm. can you elaborate a bit on that? Well, I mean, the picture I have, I mean, I, I don't know if there's anybody who's read E.M. Forster's aspects of the novel, but in it he imagines, and he must have written it, it well, I don't know when he wrote it. I was going to say 1920, but I don't, know, I don't know when. But he imagines basically a vast continuum of creative spirits and that in this room, in this continuum, uh, everybody exists in the same time, in the same time frame, or in the, or in the same framework. 
so that you could have Herman Melville talking to J.D. Salinger, you could have Holland Wolf, uh, you know, you could have Merle Haggard um, uh, talking to, um, to uh, you could have Virginia, Holland Wolf talking to Virginia Wolf. I mean, that all of them in some way are linked by their aspiration towards a larger uh, creative reality or something. Uh, and and I think you need the antic spirit of someone like Grace Paley to fully realize this, but it but it uh, but this was what I mean for Elvis, he had a pantheon of heroes and it was an ever growing one. I mean he knew more about music. He he he, he should have gotten a graduate degree from Berkeley or you know he he just he knew everything about white quartet music. He knew everything about black quartet music. He knew, you know, hillbilly music, country music, going back, he knew back to the roots. He knew, I mean, and he appreciated it all. And what he was looking to do, it wasn't, it was never to replace, but to take his place in that room, in that continuum, to be recognized, to, to achieve something that would give him a place there. And maybe at the end of his life, he, I, I don't know, maybe he yeah. would have been more grandiose than that, but I, I don't think so. I think he, he just had such a genuine love and appreciation and tried to, and brought people to the fore, uh, you know, whom he admired, uh, like Jake Hess, like Fats Domino, um, like Roy Hamilton, like Ivory Joe Hunter, uh, like James Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, expressed his admiration like little Junior Parker. But I mean, it's not like he was expressing his admiration from a kingship, from a, you know, he was expressing his admiration as someone who aspired to take his place with them. And I guess that's the continuum I see, is just we're all engaged in the same, hopefully we're all engaged in the same humanistic endeavor. Sometimes in the public sector, I'm not so sure. But within, the, within an artistic framework, you know, I, I would, and so, you know, Charles Mingus might get mad at Elvis, but ultimately there's an artistic uh, brotherhood, I think, that each could recognize. I have two more questions. I want to open it up. Um, you told me a, a, a very, uh, I loved your personal story with Elvis. I asked you oh. <laughs> about your personal connection. Do you mind repeating it to, uh, well, to everybody? Well, you play the recording from our lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I said you're recording this, right? Because, you know, I'm leaving it all, uh, what do you call it? Leaving it all on, on the stage on or something. On the stage, yeah. floor. Uh, no, I... I um, so I asked you, have you, have you asked, met him? You're right, if I'd ever met him. And, and my answer to that is always, no, I wrote him a letter. And um, I had written him a letter, and I, I think I probably wrote him two letters. But w the first one I wrote was when I, in 1967, and Elvis was totally, un I don't mean he was uncool in himself, but it was not cool to say you liked Elvis at all. And maybe it isn't still. But, um, and I wrote a thing in the Phoenix about these three singles he had done in a row, which I said, something's happening here. He's going back to his roots because there were three, uh, and I'm not going to remember. One was Guitar Man by Jerry Reed. One was U.S. Mail Big Boss Man by Jimmy Reed. Uh, he did You Don't Know Me by Eddie Arnold. I mean, there were six sides, and I, I, U.S. Mail was another Jerry Reed song. But they were very blues based, very soulful, very, and very different from what he had been recording recently. So I write this thing. And then I, so I sent it to Elvis at um, Graceland at, uh, 3764, maybe, Highway 51 South. Maybe that's the wrong address, I mean, mm -hmm. the wrong number. And, um, and, I, uh, and I wrote him a letter saying, you know, if you ever, I know you don't do interviews, but if you ever wanted to talk about music, you know, I would love to talk to you. That's all I want to talk about. I, you know, that's not, it's just, we could talk about Arthur Big Boy Crude Up, we could talk about, that's all, you know, so if you ever did. Well, at Christmas that year, I got a Christmas card from Graceland with that address on it, which was pretty, yeah, I said, well, that's cool, you know, that's really cool. And, um, and for a few years after that, I would get a Christmas card. I mean, just, you know, 10,000 people, 100,000 people got Christmas cards, but, I, but I, I thought it was pretty cool. But then, years later, uh, almost 30 years later, after I wrote uh, Last Train, uh, Jack Soden, who became a very good friend, who was running Graceland at that time, running Elvis Presley Enterprises, who was the person who resurrected Graceland, actually, in the, in the wake of Elvis' death, and um, uh, got the idea that it could be a tourist attraction. And he wrote to me, he called me after, uh, or he wrote to me or called me after, after Last Train came out, and he says, you know that question you've been asking me all these years, which was to have access to the archives of Graceland, and he had always, he had been perfectly polite, and I didn't know him very well, but 
you know, I never went anywhere. He says, I think if you asked that question, you'd get a different answer now. So I did, and I did get a different answer. And, I mean, and he wrote me a really beautiful letter about how the book had brought home to him what it was he was doing there. But anyway, so I get access to Graceland, and most of the uh, archives were housed in a warehouse uh, not too far from Graceland. And I would go there every day with my wife Alexandra and Ernst, Ernst Jorgensen, because I'd gotten him in because he was doing um, research for, on Elvis's recordings. And we would go in every day and put on our white gloves and into the warehouse and um, go, through the, uh, go through the papers trying to, and because they were so concerned about theft, so much stuff had, been, had walked out of Graceland, I wrote a, an agreement that said we wouldn't copy anything, but we could talk it into tape recorders. So the three of us are sitting there talking, Ernst is writing, talking matrix numbers. I mean, it was the most useless information. <laughs> <laughs> Ernst is a great guy and he's done incredible research, but it was frustrating because he was just fascinated by songs that Elvis hadn't recorded and, you know, had been submitted. But, um, so we're doing this stuff. And then at the end of the day, we, at uh, the, uh, Elvis's father, Vernon's office, was on the Graceland tour. And the tours ended at five, and still is, I think. And the tours ended at five o'clock. And we would drive up through the gates of Graceland, which again, it's silly, but it was just, you think, man, this is incredible. I'm driving through the gates of Graceland. You're driving up, the mm. guard waves you through. And we would go to Vernon's office. And all of his um, the file cabinets in there had been locked up, had been, uh, and uh, they had long since lost the keys. So they had to break the, Chain, I mean, they, they were chained shut, and um, so they had to, you know, saw through the chains or break the chains. And so we're going through there, too, again, we're talking into our tape recorders, correspondence, business correspondence, all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, one day, uh, one night, Alex, my wife Alexandra says to me, you've got to see this. And so she was over in the corner of the room, and she says, you know, I found this thing, and I look at it, and the typescript looked very familiar. It was like, a, you know, like an Olympia typewriter with whatever the... And it was my letter, you know, in Vernon's thing, you know, filed away and stuff. So I felt like we made a personal connection. But that was <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I just love that story. Um, last, last question. Um, and uh, as a reminder, uh, if you guys give us your email address, we're raffling off. Um, <coughs> Nicole, how many books? Uh, we'll have ten. Ten. Um, ten. Ten. Ten of uh, Peter's uh, latest book um, about Sam Phillips, but tell us a bit about actually this book and the role and and and, and Sam Phillips, and then I want to make sure that we have time for for some questions from from the audience because uh, actually, how many people in the room know who Sam Phillips is? Okay, about I guess twenty percent. <laughs> it's always good. It's the uh, the, the, tal the talented tenth, the talented twentieth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, it's good. That's, that's, uh, but he, um, well, I mean, Sam was the person who recorded Howlin' Wolf, B.B. King, Little Junior Parker, uh, The Prisoners, um, oh, uh, Rufus Thomas, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Ike, of, Ike and Tina Turner. Ike, 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 Ike Turner, Ike Turner uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, all for the first time, and, and with uh, a sound uh, that was different from anything that had been heard. A, raw, a rough sound, a raw sound, but very considered uh, sound, an intentional sound. And then uh, in 54, uh, he recorded Elvis for the first time, and with the success that Elvis had, uh, the company uh, took a different turn, and Elvis' success led Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Warren Smith, um, uh, Oh, um, uh, Miss Froggy, uh, I mean, not Miss Froggy, uh, Red-Headed Woman, Sonny Burgess, Charlie Rich, all to come into Sun. And he recorded all of them for the first time, Johnny Cash, I mean, and, and l was looking for a way, just as he had with Howlin' Wolf, with Ike Turner, with uh, all of the others, to bring out something in them that they didn't necessarily know they had in themselves, to give them a sense of, of self-worth that society did not accord to either poor whites or poor blacks. Uh, more so, I, I would say, for, you know, poor blacks, but, but very similarly. I mean, they were, they were simply written out of the history books. They were, uh, and um, 
so it, it, it was not just the history books. They were written out of the newspapers. They were, they, mm -hmm. and, and so that was his, his mission in life. And it was with the idea that this authentic um, vernacular voice, colloquial voice, had something to offer that was just as great as the greatest cultural heritage, as great as Dante, as great as Beethoven, as, you know, as great as anything. And the firm conviction that this music had a power that would reach everybody, irrespective of background. And in fact, that once the music was put over, and uh, he came to the conclusion he was going bankrupt when Elvis first walked in the door, and he was on the edge of bankruptcy when he sold Elvis's contract in November '55. But he had come to the conclusion after having hits with the Prisoners, with Rufus Thomas, with Little Junior Park, big R&B hits, which meant selling 50,000 copies, 60,000, 35,000, 75,000. He came to the conclusion that he couldn't put across his vision as he saw it in the way that he had anticipated, that Howlin' Wolf was not going to become the universal symbol or icon, he, despite the fact that Sam always said that Howlin' Wolf's music was the most inspiring, the most, you know, the most profound and the most iconic of anybody he ever recorded, including Elvis. And he came up with the idea that the only way he could put this great music across, you know, American vernacular music, fundamentally African American, but also, you know, these poor whites who had had no chance to. But the only way he could put it across was if he found a white man with, as he said, the Negro sound, and much more important, the Negro feel. Negro being an honorific, a term of respect, not. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, and he said this. He saw this for some time, and Elvis came in, and it wasn't that he heard an imitator. He wasn't looking for an imitator. He heard somebody whose voice embodied really the, the feeling and the gospel feeling, most of all, of the music that he had uh, been recording all along. And his vision was that once that success was achieved, which came to be called rock and roll, that all the great talents, the great you know, African-American talents that he had recorded before, and talents like Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Little Richard, Sam Cooke, whatever, that they that the door the gates would swing open wide and that they would all walk through the door and they would become popular uh, artists, not R and B st popular stars, not R and B stars. And that's in effect that's what happened. I mean that was the democratizing effect of rock and roll for a time. Yeah, it's it's amazing though because arguably, you know, we talk about Elvis, but if it wasn't for Sam Phillips, a lot of today's popular music would, would probably sound very different. <laughs> well, it would. And, I mean, and, and you know, the question is, it's not whether uh, the music would have developed. I'm sure the music would have developed, but I don't think anybody else would have had the patience or the, uh, you know, the, the vision to wait out the process, to wait for Elvis to reveal himself, as he did not reveal himself at all at the beginning. Or, for instance, when Sam first recorded Howlin' Wolf, he heard him on this uh, uh, on a radio station out of West Memphis, KWEM, which had a terrible signal and all kinds of crackle. And the minute he heard Howlin' Wolf in 19, the spring of '51, he said, that, "This is where the soul of man never dies." This is this, this was what he this was the vision that he had been seeking all of his life. He was only uh, 28 at the time, but he, from the time he was a kid, this was what he had. And Sam Phillips? Sam Phillips. He was, he was, wow, I did not know and, he was there. And he called up Howlin' Wolf at the radio station. He got in touch with him. And he said, look, come in any time. Come in, you know. And Wolf, he, and basically, he, what he meant by any time was he would be there at 5 o'clock in the evening. He would be there at 5 o'clock in the morning. If Wolf said he was coming in at 11 and he didn't come in until 3 in the morning, he would be there. Mm -hmm. And he was looking to put an open. And when Wolf came in with just a uh, guitar, a guitarist, and him playing, and a drummer, and his harmonica, he just said, "Look, play what you feel like playing." And he went and sort of messed around, busied himself in the control. I don't think there actually was a control room. There was a raised platform for the, you know, uh, uh, console. And um, but he uh, and just tried to allow them to. D develop what it was that they had themselves rather than impose anything and not put any pressure on them, not, not to record, to do anything. And that was, you know, and it, again, it was the same kind of thing. It was waiting for something to ha that he knew, he felt without any question was going to happen, in Wolf's case. I don't know if he was so sure with Elvis, but waiting for it to happen rather than in any way trying to dictate what happened. Hmm. Um, well, I, 
I could keep talking to you forever. Um, I want to make sure that we have some time for any questions from, from the audience. I know this is always a time where everybody's like looking at each other. We're not sure. We're not sure. It can come from either the 20% or the 80%. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be about Elvis. It doesn't have to be about Sam Phillips. <laughs> it can be about Louis C.K. last night, <laughs> two nights ago. <laughs> Well, if, if there's no more questions, I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, one, one more is, question. There's nothing so, you've always been cur curious about, nothing that, you know, Solomon Burke. Okay, good. <laughs> Libby. Oh, um, I guess, oh, hi. Um, great talk, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess my question would be, what's the, what's the most unexpected thing that you learned about Elvis in your time learning and, and um, familiarizing yourself with him as an artist? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, everything is, because you want to go in without preconceptions with anybody. You could be writing about Waylon Jennings or Rufus Thomas or Elvis. You want to go in without preconceptions. So in, a sen in that sense, everything is surprising. And uh, discovering these letters that his father had written from prison, from Parchment Farm, when Elvis was three or four. And I didn't know until then whether or not Vernon could read or write. And uh, I mean, because again, with the in the absence of the internet, you just don't know that much. But um, but they, they were very touching. But the question I would ask Elvis, if he gave an interview, uh, in the I think in the wake of his appearance on the Milton Berle show in the spring of '56, just before Steve Allen, and, and see by this time he had become big enough to be a target of the church and the politicians, not necessarily out of the you know self righteousness which. Um, I mean, uh, not necessarily out of, for morality, but really because he was big enough to call attention to the people who were criticizing him. To the, uh, you can always tell when somebody's big enough. You know, I mean, if they get the criticism, then they're big enough to call attention to the critics. But he, uh, and he says, I don't know what people are, you know, uh, making such a big deal about. He says, uh, you know, black people have been making music like this, you know, uh, for, I don't know what, you know, for years and years. He says, I can remember when I was a kid listening to old Arthur Big Boy Crudup down in Tupelo, Mississippi. He says, if I could ever um, achieve half the feeling you know, that Arthur Crudup had, then I'd be a music man like the world never saw. So I want to ask him, did you really see Arthur Crudup, or Sister Rosetta Tharp for that matter, in, in who was somebody he was also exposed to? I mean, that just fascinates me, the idea that he might have seen Arthur Crudup. Or is he talking about the, on WELO, the radio station in Mutupolo, that he heard? But I mean, it's that kind of thing that, the, I mean, the other weird, weird thing about Elvis is that he lived in a, uh, the last place his family lived when they were in Tupelo was on a um, black designated, uh, on, a, on an African-American street in a house that was designated for white occupancy. There were several. Uh, and the, um, oh, the, uh, he, he was exposed to all kinds of things. But one of the weird things that he seems to have been exposed to, there would be, there would be a revival every summer down at the end of the street in an open field. And as it turns out, you know the sacred steel players like Robert Randolph and stuff, and they, they come out of the Church of the Dominion, is it? it it's a church anyway. It's, there, there aren't that many. There are, there are churches in Florida. There's one in Brooklyn. There, there aren't that many around the country where the steel guitar has been the dominant voice. And Robert Randolph is a contemporary version of it, but it goes back to the 40s anyway, maybe the 30s. And they held their convention every year. And within the, within the uh, Dominion Church, the, the sort of mythology, they always said Elvis always liked us. I mean, we, we knew Elvis, the bishop knew, and nobody ever knew what the connection was. And I think it was North Green Street. And, and then this guy who's done all this history of the uh, steel guitar and the, the place of the steel in the Dominion Church got in touch with me because he had read in the last train about this North Green Street thing. And he's the one, and that was what made the connection for him. And he's the one who asked me, well, did, do you know if that was what he went to? And I mean, how would I know? I didn't know. But, so I'd like to ask him that too. But it, mm -hmm. it just, that's the kind of thing. It, it's just, it, it's so, it just sort of shows these we amazing connections that can be made. You had a question? Hi. Um, I was curious if you plan on writing a book about more people from the Sun label or even Stacks, or is that pretty much in Sweet Soul Music? 
Or is there anyone who you'd like to write a book about who you haven't yet? No, I decided w with Sam Phillips that that was going to be, I mean, I, when I wrote the biography of Elvis, I, you know, I'd never written a biography. I don't, I read fiction almost exclusively, so I, I'm not a big reader of biography. A little bit, but not that much. And I thought, well, all right, I've done this, you know, I did these two books of profiles, and then with Sweet Soul Music, I'd started out with the idea of that being a book of profiles. And then I thought, well, no, I've done that. And I thought, well, I'd try to do something that resembles a narrative history. I mean, that's what I say now, but, but it, it was a story that continued. And then the Elvis, I thought, well, I've never written a biography before, and that would be, and, but I, I would never, the only way I would ever have written another biography, and I, I used to joke about this, but it was like a nightmare too, would have been if Merle Haggard had called me up while he was still alive and, and said, you know, Pete, I've been reading these, these, this stuff you've been writing, and it's, it's not bad, you know. He says, I think you and I could, you know, I think we could do a pretty good book. And then I would have felt compelled to do it. The other person I would have, and I tried this for years and years and years, was Solomon Burke. Mm -hmm. And he, he and Sam Phillips are the two most charismatic people I've ever met. Two of the most brilliant, two of the funniest, and I introduced them to each other and they just stared at each other, never broke the stare, and I have no idea what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most terrible thing. I said, you know, you two should have, you've got a lot in common. You started out in the funeral business, in the mortuary, which was true, but not a, not a, neither of them cracked a smile about it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, they, and, and neither of them was like that, so, and they had no prior history, so I have no idea. Maybe they, it was just being, who was the coolest? But he would, but with Solomon, I try. That's the one book I would have done as a first-person narration. I would have done it with Solomon, and and he read the Sam. He said he read the Sam Cooke. He said it's great, it's great, Pete. You know, he says, but when are we going to do the book? And and I kept trying to. The thing about Solomon was you couldn't necessarily take everything he said literally. So if he said, look, come on out to L.A. for two weeks, we'll work on the book. Not only might you not work on the book. He might not even be in L.A. when you got there. And you would have committed the time, the money, the, you know, everything like that. He would say, I'm going to, I'll pay for your, I mean, this was the worst idea in the world. I'll pay for your flight, I'll pay for your hotel. Don't do it, you know, it's like, <laughs> but I would have, and I tried to get him to talk to his daughter, Victoria, whom he loved, uh, and who's in the funeral business herself. She works for Forest Lawn. Forest Lawn? Is that the big thing? And, um, uh, I said, you know, just start talking to her about your life. I mean, you could pick out just a little piece, and you know, just a piece. I mean, and then I'll try to work on it. We'll see if we've got something. We'll see if we can get somebody interested. I said, how about when you were, you know, the Wonder Boy preacher when you were seven or eight years old, or it's eight or nine years old, you know, in your grandmother's church, the uh, House of God for All People, Solomon's Temple, uh, named Solomon's Temple before Solomon was born, which Solomon claimed was a prediction, but I don't know. But he... Um, and he said, well, how about when I was 10? I said, okay, sure, when you're 10, that's, that's good. And I said, why, did something happen when you were 10? He said, that's when they put me out on the street. I said, wow, oh. I mean, he was serious, and I'm thinking, I wasn't being flippant at all, you know, and I'm saying, well, what? I said, well, who put you out on the street? He says, I don't know. I said, why did they put you out on the street? He says, that's what I can never figure out. And this was one of the last, one of the last three times I saw him, or the last few times I saw him, and he burst into tears. And so talk about, you know, you say, what's most surprising? What, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't take that, I mean, I take that seriously. I, I took Solomon seriously, totally seriously, even though he was also one of the funniest people I've ever met. But, you know, it was just like, so anyway, that, that, that would, but no, I, I'd say with Stax, uh, you know, that was, and the same with, with Son, that would, that would be, uh, uh, and I've been working, did I say that about the Dick, I said I was saying about the Dick Curlis, I mean, this is something I promised myself, because there was nobody else to promise, nobody else would care, that I've been working, you know, doing this profile of Dick Curlis for the last three months, and, um, you know, I, I, I think I'll, I'll be able to put it, I'll put it in an anthology, which uh, I, I want to do, it's sort of a linked anthology like Lost Highway, but, um, but no, I don't think I, this, in fact, the Dick Curlis has grown to about 30,000 words. And it's coming closer to a biography than I ever wanted to go, so. <laughs> um, Liz, is any more questions? Uh, oh, you have one more, okay. Um, so as far as the media is concerned, there have been so many adaptations and so many stories told about, I guess, in this particular case, Elvis. Do you feel like 
or have you seen any instances where sometimes the media attempts to over glorify the legacy of Elvis or tell the story in a different way that isn't as accurate as it could be? Well, yeah, no, I think totally. I think in, in a sense, in terms of marketing and packaging, there are all kinds of stories that are made up and that are unsupportable by either facts or, you know, even insights. Uh, Which is the most pervasive one that we all just bought into the mythology that's actually, a, you, you, it's not real. Well, I think the most pervasive would be this whole thing about the king of rock and roll. And I mean, hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it's a ludicrous concept. It's as ludicrous as halls of fame. And, um, you know, it's not anything that Elvis would have aspired to. But I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like... So Chuck, he never called himself the king during no, his lifetime, ever? No. And rejected it. I mm. mean, when it was... Uh, and w would never embrace it. But, but this is like Chuck, um, Jerry Lee Lewis's mother told Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, Chuck Berry is the king of rock and roll. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis was just stung by this. He says, what, I mean, this is not a person of immoderate self-regard. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and he says, what about, what about me? She says, well, you're good, son, but he's the king. <laughs> but Chuck Berry would reject the label as much as Elvis would, because as, as brilliant, as original as Chuck Berry was, as an uh, incredible body of work, as much as, you know, you could give him the Nobel Prize for Literature as well as you could give, you know, any other singer-songwriter. Um, he, uh, he, he would, the first thing he would tell you is there's nothing new under the sun. He was just insistent on that. And he'd say, there's nothing I'm doing that hasn't been done. Listen to Louis, Louis Jordan. Listen to, now I'm forgetting his guitarist's name. Listen to his guitarist and listen to the guitar solo he plays on Ain't, Ain't That Just Like a Woman, and then you'll hear the Chuck Berry style. Listen to T-Bone Walker. Listen to Nat King Cole. If I could sing like Nat King, I'd give anything to sing like Nat King Cole. Listen to Muddy Waters. I'd give anything to sing like... He says that's where Chuck Berry comes from. And so while what he did was strikingly original in the same way that you know, what Bob Dylan has done is original, what Elvis did was original. It's, it's also, it's not original, and there is no such thing. I was saying to Pan Panos, it's only to um, uh, intellectual property lawyers that there's any such thing as, as <laughs> originality. And they then, wouldn't have a job. <laughs> well, that, if you want to see one thing that's the greatest enemy of creativity, it's lawyers. It's the whole concept of of intellectual property and just encircling or, you know, just claiming ownership of a kind of cr source of creativity that really, it's, it's like, what do people say? I mean, what are Robert Pete Williams, one of the great, greatest blues singers, uh, I mean, just a great blues singer, and, uh, quite an amazing guy, but he talked about getting songs out of the air. And his songs are so unusual in terms of blues. They don't follow blues progressions, they're not rhymed. Uh, his Prisoner's Talking Blues is just one of the most heartbreaking things you'll ever uh, hear or uh, a song. Sometimes I think about committing suicide and it's kind of this talking stuff. Uh, but he, um, that was what, that's how the songs came to him, in the air. And in a sense that, that's, but you may get mixed up. You may hear things in the air that somebody else <laughs> has done and that doesn't make them any less, you know, adaptable or yours. But, but from the lawyer's point of view, they, you know, they're property. Okay, well, Peter. Thank Any lawyers you. out there? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> they led. They all led. <laughs> uh, well, on, on on that note, which by the way could be a whole different lecture that I'd love to talk with you about. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you here at Berkeley, and uh, thanks for taking the time to come and be with us. Oh, thank you, and thanks for the questions. I, I'm I'm glad we you know <laughs> we get, broke get, the silence. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you.